Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, and executioner doing what the simple folk do. Camelot. 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 It's only a model. Now that that's out of the way, let's discuss our next offender, Camelot. The original production of Alan Lerner and Frederick Lowe's take on the Arthurian legend is one of those cases where critics and audiences didn't exactly see eye to eye. The reviews were mixed, and it wasn't even nominated for the Best Musical Tony. But the cast recording was a big hit, as was a performance by the leads on The Ed Sullivan Show, and Camelot ended up running for 873 performances. Pretty good for the pre-chorus line days. The 1967 film, however, had a much less enthusiastic response. It did better than a lot of the big-budget, big-star movie musicals of that period, but it wasn't a huge hit, and to this day it divides people between ardent defenders and those who consider it yet another example of the decline of the film musical's golden age. So let's examine the case of Camelot and see if it's the real thing or only a model. We open on a battlefield before dawn, with King Arthur facing certain doom in the conflict to come. To pass the time, he monologues to his absent mentor Merlin about how things came to this point, and we all know what that means! Flashback time! <laughs> See, it all started on the day Arthur was to have his arranged marriage to Guinevere, a prospect that he views with more anxiety than eagerness. How goes the final hour as he sees the bridal bower, being legally and regally prepared? Well, I'll tell you what the king is doing tonight. He's scared. Oh, he's scared. And sin number one. I don't like Richard Harris in this role. I'm not sure if it's the way Joshua Logan is directing him or just that he was so determined to land the part, even to the point of conducting a one-man campaign against the original stage Arthur, Richard Burton, but it feels like he's trying too hard. His timber is rather pleasant, but he has this odd, overwrought delivery that takes random shifts in the middle of the phrase. And oh, the expectation, the sublime anticipation he must feel about the wedding night to come. Well, I'll tell you what the king is feeling tonight. He's numb, he shakes, he quails, he quakes, and that's what the king is doing. Tonight. This carries over to his dramatic performance, especially when he breaks out the ham for Arthur's big act one monologue. I'm through with feeble hoping. I demand a man's vengeance. Acting! Harris did go on to play Arthur on stage for many years, so I don't know, maybe he was better there. In this movie, though, he's not doing it for me. I don't get the sense of anxiety and youthful insecurity that Arthur expresses in this scene, and it doesn't get better when Guinevere shows up in her medieval Dr. Zhivago get-up to express her reservations about the whole affair. Shall I never be disputed for, or on any minstrel's lips? Never have my face recruited for launching countless ships. Here we have the first example of Vanessa Redgrave singing, which is sin number two. Granted, stepping into the shoes of Julie Andrews is a task that would daunt most vocalists, but Redgrave's talent for it is marginal at best. She goes under the pitch a lot on the higher notes, and she lacks lyricism, taking the same speak-singing-in-random-places technique that Harris uses, something that the role of Guinevere is highly unsuited for. She's also rather sedate when she performs, especially on The Simple Joys of Maidenhood, where she comes off as much too mature and sophisticated for the heedless romanticism expressed in the song, which means she has nowhere to go later in the story when Guinevere gets everything she wished for with a vengeance. It doesn't help that the staging of a lot of the musical numbers is very static and the actors don't really dramatize the songs well. It's a bit like watching Les Miserables if every character was played by Russell Crowe. Guinevere takes the first opportunity to sneak away from her retinue and onto the Narnia set, where her prayers are interrupted by Arthur falling out of a tree and onto his royal ass. Wait, please don't run. I won't harm you. You lie. You leap on me and throw me to the ground. I won't do any such thing. You'll sling me over your shoulder and carry me off. Oh, no, 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 I swear by the sword Excalibur, I won't touch you. <sighs> Why not? I think this is how men's rights activists think the world works. 
Arthur conceals his identity from his reluctant bride-to-be, but he's charmed enough to decide marrying her wouldn't be so bad after all, and persuades her to stay with a description of the world's most regimented climate. The rain may never fall till after sundown. By eight the morning fog must disappear. In short, there's simply not a more congenial spot for happily ever aftering than here in Camelot. Even though Harris comes off as less callow and more creeper in the bar who won't leave you alone, Guinevere decides she likes the kind stranger just in time for the guards to come up and start bowing and scraping to him. Nonetheless, a little deception is a pretty fitting starting point for this marriage, so it's off to the chapel with the Camelot Holiday Remix. So a few years pass, and Arthur sets about the business of trying to be a good king in a sequence that feels like it was cobbled together from what was left on the Game of Thrones cutting room floor. Would there be jealousy? All the knights will be claiming superiority and want to sit at the head. We'll make it a round table, so there is no head. <laughs> Wow, good thing none of his subjects can see him running around like a lunatic. Bottom line, Arthur gets the idea to invent chivalry and starts a fashion for circular dinette sets, and his riders spread throughout the land with a summons to the round table. Which, for some reason, they distribute to illiterate peasants. News of Camelot's new order of mercy and justice eventually travels to France, where one Lancelot du Lac is busy practicing his best studly pose. I've never lost in battle or game, I'm simply the best by far. When swords are crossed, tis always the same, one blow and all the cross. This song, C'est Moi, is sin number three. Unlike the other leads, Franco Nero's singing was dubbed by a gentleman named Jean Merlino, and you can definitely hear the uptick in tonal quality. The problem is, Nero himself doesn't demonstrate the right attitude for the song. Lancelot in these early scenes, as befits a character who was originated by Robert Goulet, is supposed to have a lot of bravado about him. Think of him as a nobler, more principled version of Gaston, complete with self-adulating I Am song. Nero is much too stiff and not nearly energetic enough, which makes the song a lot less entertaining than it should be. Nero's rather sedate performance brings up another sin there isn't a whole lot of conflict in the first half of this movie. Because the actual antagonist doesn't show up until about two-thirds of the way through, most of the tension in the early part of the play is supposed to be between Lancelot versus Guinevere and the other knights, who find him to be an insufferable goody two-hooves. Now, this kind of interpersonal clashing can make for effective drama, but because Nero doesn't make that much of an impression, you never get the sense of that building animosity, or of the sparks that fly between Guinevere and Lancelot. At times, it's hard to believe Redgrave and Nero hooked up on the set of this movie, because the chemistry doesn't always come across on screen. Lancelot's arrival in Camelot is somewhat inauspicious when he gets into a fight with a Renfair stuntman, who of course he'll beat soundly only to learn it's... We've been out here six seconds, you've already managed to blow the routine. Arthur's pretty chill about being knocked to the ground, especially since Merlin foretold Lancelot's coming. Although he was surprisingly circumspect on the whole banging your wife part of the picture. More on that later. He's mostly unnerved by Lancelot's overdone remorse about the whole business. Oh, I beg your majesty to forgive me. Not because I deserve it, but because by forgiving me, I'll suffer more. Yep, definitely a Catholic. Unfortunately for Lancelot, Camelot doesn't have any immediate need for Daring Do, as everyone else is taking part in the May Day festivities, in what is the calmest Bacchanal I've ever seen. It's May, it's May, the lusty month of May. Okay, whose idea was it to turn the most joyous number in the entire score into a Marilyn Monroe ballad? No wonder this movie is three hours long with you dragging down the tempo like that. Things do pick up when the chorus comes in, but the risque antics described in the lyrics come down mostly to some light frolicking. It's May, it's 
Which makes this as good a place as any to discuss sin number five. The mood of this movie feels off. Camelot is a mix of comedy and drama. While the story is a relatively dark tale about infidelity, betrayal, and how hard it is for idealism to survive the vagaries of the world, there's also a lot of humor in the piece, especially in the songs which are frequently light, witty, and sparkling. Joshua Logan seems to be afraid to take the material as anything less than 100% seriously. Everything is staged with the solemnity and import of a Shakespearean tragedy, so the lighter moments of the story come across as awkward, like when Harris is leaping around like mad during the opening of How to Handle a Woman. Well, I should tell you what, you obviously forgot that how a ruler rules a queen. And I'm sorry, I know that the costumes and art direction won Oscars, but I just do not like this visual aesthetic. Nearly everything is in drab earth tones with those frequently bizarre and oh-so 1960s stylistic touches, resulting in something that is both too much and not enough. It doesn't speak to me of the pageantry and romance of an idealized medieval court. It just alternates between boring and ridiculous. Nobody apart from Arthur is impressed with Lancelot's declarations of physical prowess and spiritual purity, least of all Guinevere, even though Lance is actually pretty mild for a self-proclaimed fanatic. In any case, Guinevere decides to haze the newcomer by coaxing three of the best knights to challenge him at the next big jousting tournament. I swear, half the accessories in this look like projects from those old At Your Fingertips film strips. But Lancelot proves that his claims were not just idle boasts, as he unseats two of his opponents and then, when the third takes a lance to the chest, gets the opposition to do him a solid. This ends up softening Guinevere's heart because, as Mary Magdalene will tell you, resurrection is the ultimate aphrodisiac. And thus we enter the longing looks phase of the movie. Lancelot looks longingly at Guinevere, who looks longingly back, while Arthur notices the mutual looking and throws in some longing looks of his own. And everybody waxes melodramatic about the situation. You know this earth better than I. I only fell upon it a few hours ago. What are you talking about? Wow. True, wow. In between the longing looking, Arthur decides it's high time to have Lancelot formally invested as a knight of the round table, and he is dubbed with all due ceremony, many longing looks, and Guinevere rocking the Amneris and Elton John's Aida style. Look, I apologize, I am trying to keep the Monty Python references to a minimum because they've been done to death and are too easy and all that, but this just has to be said. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! Sin number six is the amount of filler in this movie. Again, this has something to do with the fact that I don't care for the look of the movie in general, so I'm not really in a mood to sit back and admire the visual porn. But the relatively slow book has always been one of Camelot's biggest weaknesses, and the long, drawn-out sequences sprinkled throughout the film version magnify that problem. Everything stops dead while we're having a wedding scene, or a knighting scene, or a knight's riding through the land montage, and in one case the filler gets in the way of the music when Lancelot's big number, If Ever I Would Leave You, is interrupted with an overblown sequence of Guinevere waltzing into his bedchamber. Could you turn down the wind machine, honey? I'm getting dust in my eyes. With the round table and his code of chivalry established, Arthur finds himself the beloved king of a content populace who no longer fear crime or violence. 
The one dark spot in this utopia is the rumor of Lancelot and Guinevere's affair, which forces Lancelot to defend his honor in trial by combat and Arthur to banish the slanderers. I'll speak up. Which is it, Belinor? The sword or withdrawal? I must have been mistaken, sir. This part is actually quite effective because we see how tyranny can creep into even the most well-intentioned of systems. But no matter, we're nearly two hours into the movie, and that's as good a time as any to introduce our villain, right? How dare you enter unannounced? But I was announced. And were you not informed to return this afternoon? I'm busy this afternoon. Ah, oh, Mordred, where have you been? Arthur's bastard son, in every possible sense of the term, is a breath of fresh air. He's disarming, witty, cheerfully insolent, and feels like the only person who isn't determined to stay mired in drama. The only thing that keeps him from being a saving grace is that he doesn't have enough screen time to make enough difference in the overall film. Mordred's in Camelot to cause a general ruckus and usurp the throne of England, and he's pretty obvious about his overall wickedness. But Arthur steadfastly refuses to deal with that because, hey, turning his back on the problem has worked for him thus far. Besides, he has better things to do, like setting up a judicial system to replace the old barbaric trial-by-combat method. A jury decides. That is why it is called trial by jury. The jury? Who in thunderation are they? It's none of their damn business in the first place. Ugh, this is making the Senate scenes in Phantom Menace look like the finale of The Avengers. To distract themselves from Mordred's plotting, Arthur and Guinevere engage in another song. I have been informed by those that know them well. They find relief in quite a clever way. When they're sorely pressed, they whistle for a spell. And whistling seems to brighten up their day. And that's what simple folk do. This is one of the better numbers in the movie, odd shifts between speaking and singing notwithstanding. It's rather fun, and there's some genuine chemistry between Harris and Redgrave. And then you had to just go and ruin the ride. Those of you familiar with the stage version of Camelot know that What Do the Simple Folk Do ends with the observation that the peasants tend to engage in the same grass is greener mentality that Guinevere has been pondering. Dropping the punchline spoils the song. Instead of allowing it to be a brief bit of lightness in the increasingly dark second half of the story, they've turned it into another dour moment when we've had way too many of them already. Meanwhile, Mordred's attempts to stir the round table into open rebellion are going quite well for him. Arthur decides he can't take any more of this heavy-handed symbolism and decides to go hunting. Because sure, things are going fine right now, no harm in taking off for a few hours, right? He winds up in a sort of enchanted hollow where he gads about with the animals and things start to get really strange. What's, What's the, the best, best thing for being, being sad? sad? You, you told me once. The best thing for being sad is to learn something. And even though we've already discussed the filler, this scene on its own is enough to get sin number eight. You might be wondering where Merlin's been this whole time. In the stage version, he's taken out of the picture early when he gets bewitched by Nimue, which explains why he isn't around to warn Arthur about the dangers presented by Mordred or Lancelot and Guinevere's amour. The movie version never explains that. Merlin just pops up at random with no explanation for what happened to him or what's going on. I get the feeling that's because Logan was trying to tone down the supernatural aspects of the story, which is almost always the first thing anyone does when they're afraid their Arthurian legend won't be taken seriously. But it's hard to take this scene seriously either. It's random, out of nowhere, and it doesn't tell us anything that we didn't already know from the first part of the movie. If you aren't feeling the running time by now, this will do the trick. Arthur's sylvan revel, or whatever this is, gets interrupted by Mordred putting his wonderful Grinchy plan into action. You want me to be your son? No more than I. Then prove to me I'm wrong. Stay in the forest tonight. Give your son the lesson of his life. Show him how 
virtue can triumph without the help of fear. As colossally stupid as this is on Arthur's part, it's still an improvement over the original stage version, where Mordred bribes his aunt Morgan Le Fay with a bunch of candy and convinces her to keep Arthur in the forest overnight by building an invisible wall around him. Yeah, that's not the proudest moment in the Learner in Low canon. And speaking of obviously bad ideas, Lancelot takes the clearly marked bait and waltzes right into Guinevere's chambers the minute Arthur's absence is announced, which gives Mordred the perfect opportunity to ambush the pair. Arthur! <laughs> what was that? I can't tell if she's trying to defend Lancelot, she was creating a distraction, or if she just tripped. Lancelot escapes with much buckling of swash, nearly running down Arthur again in the process, so give him points for symmetry. But Guinevere is put on trial and found guilty of treason, forcing Arthur to agonize dramatically as he must put duty and law above his heart. Guinevere is sentenced to burn at the stake, in a scene that's so drawn out you'd swear everyone was dragging their feet just to give Lancelot time to rescue her. For that's exactly what happens, as Mordred rubs the situation in Arthur's face and Harris works extra hard to get as much ham in as he can before the movie ends. Merlin, make me a whore. Let me fly away from here. And that's where we came in, with Arthur forced to go to war with Lancelot and his allies and Mordred amassing his own army somewhere on the sidelines. Guinevere has joined a convent, the knights are either dead or thirsting for revenge, and the ideals of the round table lie in ruins. But it's not all bad. Arthur gets to make peace with the two people he loves best in the world, and there is someone who still believes in Arthur's dream. What's your name? It is Tom, my lord. Where do you come from? From Warwick, my lord. Bit of trivia, the boy here is implied to be Sir Thomas Mallory, whose La Morte to Arthur would become a cornerstone of the Camelot mythos. For that's exactly what Arthur charges the lad to do, hide out the battle and return to England to keep Camelot alive in story, legend, and a stirring final reprise. Don't let it be forgot that once there was a spot for one brief shining moment that was known as Camelot. As written, Camelot has some large weak spots. The book is kind of slow and it never seems to make up its mind on how seriously it wants to take the whole thing. But with a strong score and some brilliant stretches, particularly the conclusion, it can be done well. The film version, unfortunately, tends to magnify the flaws in the material rather than smooth them over. There are still some great moments, but they come in between long stretches where absolutely nothing happens. That, and it feels too convinced of its own importance, which is always tempting to puncture. Therefore, the Court of Musical Hell orders the following punishments. For his over-the-top performance, we condemn Richard Harris to take remedial acting classes with William Shatner. For the frequently dreary color palette, the production design staff is to be exiled to the state of Nebraska. Finally, for the long, drawn-out experience, we condemn Joshua Logan and the screenwriters to sit through an extended edition of The Hobbit Trilogy. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned.